All right, salam everybody. My name is Muhammad Ali. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. I'm uh, based in our Washington, D.C. office. Um, thank you all for, for being here, and thank you to our panelists. Um, I will we'll start with quick introductions. We have next to me, uh, Idab. She was uh, born in Gaza. She's lived in Kuwait up until the first Gulf War, where she moved to the U.S. in 92. Hadab chose to make Los Angeles her home, beautiful Los Angeles. Uh, she's been active in the Muslim and interfaith communities in Southern California since 1994, working on building bridges, bringing people together. She served on the board of several Muslim nonprofit organizations, including New Horizons School Los Angeles, Shura Council of Southern California. She was elected to be the first chairwoman of both MPAC in 2007 and the Islamic Center of Southern California in 2016. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> Hadab served and continues to serve on the board of several interfaith groups and organizations, including University of Religious Conference at UCLA, the U uh, Los Angeles Council of Religious Leaders, the, Academic, uh, the Academy of Judaic, Christian, and Islamic Studies. Uh, Hadab works with humanitarian organizations focusing on elevating the suffering of children in Palestine and the Middle East. Thank you for being with us. Next, we have S.T. Chandler. She's the founder of Jewish Voice for Peace LA. Uh, she's a longtime film and media professional who focuses now on human rights. In 2010, she founded the LA chapter of JVP and now proudly serves on the JVP uh, and uh, JVP action boards of directors, along with Nagwa Ibrahim. She's the host and producer of KP. Uh, FK's long-running radio show, Middle East in Focus. Thanks, Esty. And uh, next we have Dr. Ahmed Sobo. He's the uh, chairman of the Islamic Shura Council of Southern California. Uh, Dr. Sobo is the chairman of the, um, he's also the religious director of the Yorba Linda Islamic Center and a sought-after speaker of the Muslim and interfaith communities of Southern California. Uh, since 2002, he's been an active in uh, building bridges in the Muslim community with other faith communities and has been a lecturer about Islam at churches, temples, mosques, uh, schools, and universities. Um, he's a Palestinian American and also works on promoting peace resolution in uh, Palestinian causes by refuting uh, misconceptions and misinformation about the conflict in the Middle East through building alliances, relationships with the different faith communities. He's a founding member of the Inland Valley Project for Mies, uh, Peace in the Middle East. With that, thank you. I will give each one of our panelists about a minute to uh, kick things off and share some thoughts, and we'll start with Esti, then uh, Ahmed, and then we'll finish off with Hadeb. How's everyone doing this afternoon? So I think we're here to talk about how we promote peace. Um, I think that the one thing that we're seeing right now is a shift. There's a fundamental shift. For a long time, a singular narrative was the only thing that was in the zeitgeist, unless you were in you know small circles that didn't you know get their news from mainstream media. And now we're seeing this shift, we're seeing, we've been seeing it at JVP for years with our younger generations, and the whole world is seeing it now, as was discussed in the prior panel on college campuses, where young people just aren't willing to be told to sit down and be quiet. They, they know the truth when they see it, they know bigotry when they see it, and they know falsehoods when they hear them. So we're, we're in a new position now for us all to be engaged and to continue to help that narrative shift by pushing out some facts and information that hasn't been out there before. Thank you for that. And we'll touch upon the demographic shift um, shortly. On to you, sir. So uh, when I get to uh, speak about uh, my community, I get always asked the question about Palestine, even though my presentation is about Islam. And I always try to tell people, let's not mix things. There is a, there's a, we should distinguish between 
the Islamic cause and what's going on in Palestine because it's not a religious war. It's not a conflict between Muslims and Jews. Actually, when uh, October 7th escalation started and the crisis started, I got so many calls from uh, media outlets and they're trying to push it, tell us about the situation between Muslims and Jews. And, and it's like, I'm, I'm, it's not. It's not about Islam and Judaism. It's about occupier and occupied. But then I came to realize that there is a vicious attack on Islam and Muslims since then, right, in the media in the political statements, and they're equating what's going on there and saying this is Islamic terrorism and all that. And, 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 and it came to my mind something I heard from one of the advisors of the former US presidents who said, there is a systematic effort to make American Muslims look bad so they do not influence the foreign policies of the United States in the favor of the Palestinians in the Middle East. <laughs> And that is the connection between the American Muslim community and what's happening in Palestine and what's happening in Gaza. And uh, if we realize that and understand that, then we will be able to tackle the issue in a much, much better way. Uh, we definitely need to own the narrative, change it, and the way we talk and the terms that we use and the vocabulary that we use, it's not about what the Jews did. It's not about, what, it's, it's about the Israeli government. It's about the Israeli forces, it's about the Israeli planes that are killing and bombarding. That's, this, this is just a simple example how we can change the narrative and make it work. Uh, and, and that's what we've been doing for the past 10, 15 years. The shifts that Esti was talking about that we'll talk about in a little bit, that's the result of work like organizations like MPAC and CARE and Shura Council. So I think there is a, not a small light at the end of the tunnel. There is a big light at the end of the tunnel that we all, inshallah, will be seeing it soon. Thank you. Um, as the person from Gaza on the panel, and I vowed, uh, especially in the, in the recent months uh, plus, uh, that I w will be their voice. Uh, so when we talk about a narrative, I want to take you a little ba bit back in history. Um, in 1969, actually before 1969, um, when the State of Israel became a state, uh, Golda Meir, who was the uh, prime minister, uh, she has a famous saying where she said, uh, the old will die, and the young will forget. <clears throat> and that's what she was talking about, the Palestinians, how they will connect to their cause. Um, in 1969, uh, there was a, 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 an Israeli by the name Dennis Roland. Not sure how many probably uh, know this person. But this person literally burned Al-Aqsa, your first Qibla. He burned it. And that night, Golda Meir said that she went to bed scared. And first thing in the morning, she called her cabinet. And she said to them, I think that Arab armies are going to come into Tel Aviv. And the morning came, and no one came. Because someone not controlling the narrative, but controlled the connection, the emotions, the connection that Muslims have to Palestine, to Al-Aqsa. And that's what they were counting on. The old will die, and the young will forget. Well, the people of Gaza proved everybody wrong, because they stayed. They prove that they are from the land, and their faith in God Almighty, and what God Almighty had written for them to shed their blood in protection of their land. Even though I was born there, but really, my head is off to them for their level of faith. Their level of faith that it doesn't matter when the whole world come to fight you and ethnically cleanse you and call genocide and put their money behind this genocide and not only put their money, but stand and cheer. You ask the little kids in Gaza, 
why don't you leave? They're like, we're here to stay. This is our land. So when we want to change the narrative, let's take it to the basics. What is the narrative? Who controls the narrative? I've been hearing organizations, I've been hearing think tanks, but my call is to each and every one of you because we all have a part to do and we all eventually are gonna have to stand in front of God Almighty and God will ask us, what have you done in October and November 2023 when your brothers and sisters in Gaza were being butchered? It's your call to change that narrative, each and every one of you. Thank you, that was very powerful. Um, on the note of changing narrative, there has, there has been a shift. I think there's been a, a seismic shift as we look at the, percep the public perceptions of Americans towards Israel by, by generation. Uh, baby boomers right now uh, have a favorable view of Israel at a uh, at 83 percent. 83 percent of them have a favorable view. Now you drop that down to the uh, to millennials and Generation Z, it drops to less than half. 48 percent, but you know we can we can say 50 percent just for easy use. Um, I want to ask the panelists what what do you attribute that drop to? Why was it a narrative shift and change, and what has been the uh, result? Personally, I think that the narrative shift is because as long as younger people have been alive, all they've seen is Israel attacking Palestinians. They've seen them attacking Gaza. They've seen disgusting slogans used to describe those attacks. They've seen, um, you know, in, in, in these times, every morning, they wake up for, for people who watch... The news in the morning, every morning, there's a report on how many Palestinians were killed. So I think that it's, it's very difficult if you're not a young person that is affiliated um, in the Jewish community where you're getting a constant influx of, you know, a different narrative. If you're just out in the world, it's very, very difficult for young people to see Israel as anything but the aggressor. They are learning history. They're learning the fallacies of the histories that my generation and other generations were taught about our founding. And they, so they understand immediately when they hear the history of the founding of Israel. And like I said, I think they're just not having it. They, they, they believe in facts. They believe the truth. And they know that Violence is only going to beget more violence. And so they clearly are cheering for the Palestinians who they feel have a righteous cause, which of course they do. Well, we can answer the question in two folds. Why the older generation was so in support of Israel. There was, again, a systematic effort over the past 60, 70 years to do that. There is a documentary, you can watch it online, it's called Real Bad Arabs, where it shows you how Hollywood intentionally made sure that Middle Eastern Arab Muslims always look bad, again, so the support of Israel does not get affected in the United States. So all these generations, that's what been, they've been brainwashed or seen all their lives as they are growing. Uh, the, is the, the presence of social media made a huge impact on the ability to see through and beyond the regular media outlets. Maybe older generation, all what they could have seen, what CNN says, what Fox says, what MSNBC says. Now, you don't have to. They don't, they don't even watch those outlets. They go directly to TikTok and Instagram, and they see the things that are really happening there. So that's another... And I would say also, don't ignore the presence of uh, young Arab Muslim students on campus who became friends with others and shared with them the things that they see and the things that they know. That does make a difference in, in the narrative and how uh, people are seeing the, the situation.
And what impact has that had? What, how has there, have there been, you know, whether it be a policy, whether it be a kind of shift in the way that, um, you know, people are actually using their voices to be helpful? How have you guys, how have you independently or collectively seen any of that actually change into, um, change into to action? Let, let me take that uh, as part of the first question. Um, I think the youth are the future. And uh, <laughs> that's one of the reasons why Israel is killing more than 5,000 kids in Gaza, because they are the future. Um, but we look at the, the, the youth here in the United States. Um, if you notice, they're all connected to human rights. Not just for one group, but for all the underdogs. Because they understand that human rights is not, you, you don't divide it, you know? You don't, you're not selected, selective of who actually deserve to have those human rights. And whether they are, you know, you know African American, Palestinians, or, um, you know, all, all the groups that are being dehumanized. And the youth are not afraid. And this is why they're more vocal. They don't have the baggage that the adults have uh, from having been oppressed in one way or the other. The youth don't have that. And I think this is something that not only we need to understand, but we need to nurture. And we need to give them the tools so that they continue uh, being vocal and continue taking those stands while they're protected. Because that's the only way we can actually uh, make, a, make a shift and make a change because, you know, as, as a Palestinian looking at what Palestinians have been going through from the beginning, from the beginning, I mean, you talk about the United Nations and the um, uh, universal human rights that is, you know, United Nations universal human rights. You go through the first basic 35 and not a single one applies to the Palestinians. Not a single one. But the same youth look at a couple of those, and we as Americans now, and as the previous panel described, that anybody who's now pro-Palestinian is called anti-Semitic, people are losing their jobs, they're losing their freedom to speak. And those, this is one of the human rights. So as we are all standing here, you know, sitting here, you know, if we do not exercise our right to speak the truth, then we are not fulfilling one of our human rights as, as declared by the United Nations. So we need to lead by example. I'd like to uh, add on that. Um, so if you notice for the past several weeks, so many big corporations decided to stop donating or funding to universities because they're allowing pro-Palestinian demonstrations on campus, right? And nothing harms young Americans or make them more upset than someone affecting their pride or taking their freedom from them. So you can imagine how young people are seeing this. It's gonna backfire on the pro-Israeli lobby when they see that I'm not begging for your money to tell me shut up or I won't give you money. Right? So that, that will, in my opinion, will also make a big impact on what's going to happen in the next several years when these young people remember that because they went out in a demonstration, because they sp spoke up their minds, someone says, I'm not going to give money to your university. They're not going to forget that. Yeah. And I see uh, Sahar so nodding her head over there. Let me just do a quick intro. Thanks for, for being here. Uh, she's the Director of Fundraising and Program Coordination, co Coordinator at the Palestinian Assembly for Liberation in California. With over 10 years of social media activism, organizing, and political fundraising for Palestine, she's a recipient of ADC's Hala Maksud Award in 2020. Thank you for joining us, and I think I'd really appreciate if you could weigh in on, uh, from your social media expertise on the shifting narrative and how that has an, uh, an, an impact. Sorry, I apologize for being late. Um, first and foremost, I'm a Palestinian Christian, and um, as an activist, my, my role as, uh, is to elevate the voice of Palestinianism first, obviously, because that's, that's what I show up with, but also to remind the world that Palestinian Christians exist and that we are also being uh, persecuted and slaughtered. We lost about 40, 50 family members in Gaza, uh, Palestinian Christian family members, and a, co a couple weeks ago in the Greek Orthodox Church, the church that I was baptized in. Uh, so, so 
my role in the community is to, again, remind the world that Palestine is not only a Muslim issue, it's a human issue involving Christians, Palestinian Jews, and non-believers. Uh, so my experience has been a lot of backlash from Zionist communities. They, they literally want to <laughs> they want to erase Christianity. Not only do they want to erase Palestinians, but they, they, they're telling, the, especially the, the uh, Christian Zionist community seems to be a bigger enemy to Palestinians than the actual Zionist community. And so for me and others like myself, I think our focus, and this is a great opportunity, is to educate the Christian Zionists in the US and abroad and remind them Remind them that Israel is no friend to Christianity. Remind them that Israel is, is harassing and murdering and slaughtering Palestinian Christians as we speak all over Palestine, not just in Gaza. So that's sort of where I come in and folks like myself come in. If I could just ask for you all to hold your uh, you know, very well due or overdue pause or your applause until the very end so that we can kind of get through as many comments as possible. But I think you uh, were about to say something? Or perhaps? Okay. Um, so how, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is there's a segment of society that you had mentioned that there are you know, evangelical Christians who shouldn't be voting or should not be in support of the way that they actually are. There's others who are perhaps not going to change, but there is that segment of the population that is somewhat undecided, that they overall care about human rights, but they have a double standard when it comes to the application of human rights. But they're not ideologues, that they're you know, concerned about other things when it comes to politics or otherwise. How do we get to those guys? How do we convince them, them that here's, here's what's going on and here's why you should care and here's what the right thing to do is? You know, there are organizations like uh, FASNA, Friends of Sabeel North America, and uh, Christian Palestinians uh, for Peace. I believe that, and again, I'm a proud Palestinian Christian, but I show up as a Christian first. Um, or, sorry, as a, pal <laughs> as a Palestinian first. But organizations like FASNA and PCAP really are pivotal in this community in terms of reaching out to the Western Christian community that's on the fence, that are really are not quite as indoctrinated as the evangelical, evangelical community. Um, and educating through their churches, through their uh, schools, and it's just a matter of continuing to answer those questions. Again, social media, I mean, I, social media activism, and I've said it from, the, from 10 years ago, is going to change the world <laughs> and a lot of Christian um, social media followers are listening to messages like myself so between social media between reaching out to Christian communities through churches through universities through corporations it's just a it's it's a matter of educating and and showing and and providing the evidence of why it is that Zionism is 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 a death to Christianity as as much as it is to Islam I'd like to also, uh, uh, I might disagree with you that there is hopeless segment of the community that we should not reach out. Actually, we should. Uh, after 9-11, we thought there's no way you can change the mind of the far right about our faith and our religion. And I found out that no, we could, we did. And uh, when we talk to them, when we uh, talk in a way that we're not there to debate, we're not there to challenge, we're not there to fight. I'm just here to tell you what I think. So if instead of going instead of a large group of people at an evangelical church, instead of saying, you're wrong, I'm right, say, you know what, let's not debate. I'm going to tell you what I believe in. I'm going to tell you as a Palestinian, what's my perspective? Even though I'm not Christian, but I always play the role, the, the card that I'm from Bethlehem. Yeah. So I say, I'm from a small right. town in the Middle East called Bethlehem. Do you know it? And that That's breaks right. the ice. And, and, right. and you, you build friendship. Not only that, work with them on things that we have common between. That's like right. family, parents' rights family rights, family values. These are things that we can, we can find common grounds and work with them on it. Uh, so this is the, the tough crowd I like to, to work with. And I've been invited to their own uh, TV stations, TV programs, their mega churches to speak at, and I saw a big difference. So I would not lose a hope from talking to anyone uh, about this. And, and on that point, if I, if, 
If I may add, I often, uh, when I argue with, with individuals, I, I tell them I was born 10 miles away from where Christ was baptized. I was baptized in a village in biblical Palestine where the Virgin Mary and Joseph stopped overnight to rest on their way to having Jesus Christ. So don't ask about how Christian am I. <laughs> and so that kind of shuts them up pretty quickly. What Suhair is saying is so important because it's hard sometimes to understand when you see the weight of disingenuous organizations like APAC or the Anti-Defamation League that are really there to block any positive information about Palestine, to make sure to keep feeding the pro-Israel narrative. But the truth of the matter is the size of the impact of how many Jewish Zionists there are in America versus Christian Zionists, we're completely dwarfed. There really is this amazing opportunity. And as was being said, the key is meeting them where they are. I love speaking at churches. I love it because they're Christian. They believe in, you know, basically the same things, values as Muslims and Jews. So you meet them where they are and explain what happened. They get it. They really get it. And that's the key. No matter, I think, if we're in a, in a giant room, if we're in a small room, is trying to meet people where they are and bringing them a step with you. And if they're, if they're coming, bring them one more step. And the next time, I promise they're going to come back with questions. And the best thing that could happen is they go home and they ask Google some questions and they educate themselves because when they get the information themselves, they feel like they, they, they believe it quicker. It's not somebody else talking them into it. It's them gathering their own information. As someone who's been doing interfaith for 30 plus years, I never uh, shied away from the discussion of Zionism, whether with Christians or even with Jews. And you have to always put the person in front of you as a human being and understand where they're coming from. And I found out from my experience that when we discuss Zionism, and I always challenge them, I always define and share with them the definition of Zionism from my perspective. Because all of a sudden they realize that it's totally different from their definition. So you cannot have a discussion when you're talking about two different things. Absolutely. So once you actually start sharing and start simplifying and start clarifying where you stand, what, not only the definition, but where you stand on the issue and why you are opposed of their definition and how their definition is telling them to treat Palestinians, then at least we start having a ground to discuss. To me, the truth is a seed. You plant it no matter what. God Almighty is responsible for letting it come out. Changing people's hearts and minds start with the first step, and that is allowing the conversation. But do not allow the conversation from a week of point. Uh, I mean, a point of weakness, because you have to come as equal. So I advise and I encourage each and every one of you to start educating yourself, get the proper tools. As we're talking about the youth, the youth, the youth really do their homework. They know, um, but it is our responsibility to, to, find, to find the truth and find way of communicating. Um, in the last month, I have, and I'm not an expert in social media, but I have taken to Facebook. I even made my profile public and I started sharing information. I get messages from all over the world, from people I've never heard of, I've never known, and they're telling me, thank you for being a genuine source of information. I'm just sharing, I'm giving them facts, and I'm saying to all my friends and their friends, please share and let them share, because that's how the information will, will spread, and this is how we counter the narrative 
that the Israeli propaganda and sadly the US media now is spreading, which is not the truth. What is happening in Gaza, for example, to the, to the children. Our own president, you know, challenged how many Palestinians were killed in Gaza, how many kids were killed. But I've taken to Facebook and every post I say, they killed the childhood in Gaza with a picture or a video of a child shivering from being bombed or a child injured or a child crying for his mom and dad who were killed or a child looking at his brother and giving his brother the shahada. Yeah. These, are, these are the facts and these are the truth that we want to share to change people's hearts. And if you look at how many normal citizens within the US that are wondering about the faith of the Gazans, you know, they're interested in learning about Palestine and Gaza from how they've seen the faith of the people in Gaza, their homes demolished, their, 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 their country wiped out, and their families are being killed, and their brothers and sisters are now parts. They can't even find the full body. So, so, and yet they ask may, them, yeah. and they say, Alhamdulillah. So Alhamdulillah. all of a sudden, the world is interested. So let me just uh, comment on that point. Now, we're trying to change the narrative here, right? We're trying to reach out to people. There are things that we can say it with each other, and there are things that we need to be careful how you say it to others. We have to understand that the society that we're living in, if we keep bombarding them with pictures of dead children, they will, it will go above their head. It will be that it is too much for them to handle. Actually, putting a picture of a little cat tired from the bombardment could be more effective than putting pictures of many children killed, sadly, right? The narrative on the other side, you know when they are trying to gain the support of others, you know what they say? The poor citizens of Israel are not able to go to the nightclubs and the coffee shops at night. Right, right. Uh, just let me are you, are you following what I'm trying to say here? Let me add real quick. In the 10 years I've been on social media, around the clock, 24 seven, exposing Zionism, trying to educate the masses, on what Palestinian, uh, what the Palestinians have been going through for the past 75 years. I have never seen the outpour of solidarity from the Western civilization. Now keep in mind for 80, the, 80, the 8 billion people on this planet, 90% of society, of the world has always been with Palestine. We know that. We have been, we've been trying to wake up that final 10%, that 10% meaning the American voters the Western voters that have been indoctrinated for 75 years, well, guess what, folks? They're up, they're waking up, and they're pissed, excuse my French. Not only are they waking up because of the, ch the graphic videos, with all due respect, I agree with you to a certain extent, but because of those graphic videos all over social media, pouring down their feeds, mothers, American uh, housewives f from every, every culture, they can't take it, and that is what's, what's shifting the narrative. The reality is finally starting to pour in, so much so that the, the, the Islam has grown within the past 30 days. Have we done the figures, how many people yeah. are reverting to Islam? Yes. It is unbelievable. <laughs> because of Gaza, there are going to be more Muslims in this world than ever before, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> and so social media, the government has been trying to shut down TikTok. TikTok is a platform that's owned, that is not ran by Zionists. Every one of you right now, I hated TikTok until last month. I don't like taking videos of myself and talking. I thought it was a silly platform. They have now been called a national security, th th uh, security um, threat <laughs> to Israel and to the United States. That's how powerful social media is. In fact, Meta, that's owned by Zionists, let's be honest with ourselves, is now unable to keep up with the pro-Palestine posts and educating the masses so much so that they're not actually censoring a lot of the posts like they used to up until this past few weeks. Um, same with, with, uh, with X and same with Instagram. F social media, again, I can't stress this enough, and I love that you started on social media. I've been telling 
the, the masses, please, uh, I, I don't know if there's a lot of Arab, I've been talking to Arabs all over social media, please, I don't care how old you are, I know it's, it's not fun, it's, uh, sometimes it's a little technical for a lot of folks, but open up social media accounts, specifically TikTok, because that's the biggest threat right now, and just share, 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 morning, afternoon, and night, and do it public, don't do it private. I'm telling you people, social media is going to free Palestine, oh. and it's going to bring peace to this world, and it's going to end Zionism. I swear to God it is. I just want to clarify for people who aren't so familiar that um, Meta is the parent company of Facebook and Instagram and Messenger. Yeah. And one more thing. Two years ago, three years ago, when I posted about Razan, uh, and Najjar, who was assassinated during the Gaza uh, Rite of Return or uh, March, March of Return marches. I posted a post about an IDF, an American gal that left the United States to go to, to Israel to fight. Long story short, that post uh, got me sued for $6 million. Is, this girl, this ex-IDF individual, hired the most powerful uh, lawfare Zionist organization to come after me, threatened me, $6 million lawsuit. Uh, came to California to try to change the laws in California. It's, it's, you can Google it, you'll, you'll see a million articles online. This is how much of a threat social media is. To come after one person that speaks up, uh, so imagine there's, there's millions and millions of folks like myself who are exposing right, them right now. They can't keep up, they're done, they're finished. We have a couple of more minutes left. I do want to ask the audience if they have any questions. Um, I guess is the answer to that. <laughs> while, while we're doing the, uh, the mic okay, service, let me ask you guys one final question. Um, APAC has been brought up. Others, other groups have been brought up. But APAC is very good at what they do. They've been very good at what they do for a very long time. Do we need a APAC adjacent to kind of bring together our yes. thoughts to deliver one singular message yes. and do so repeatedly and do so in a well-funded, well-organized, methodical and professional way? Presumably the answer is yes, so I'll get to the hard question is how do we do it? Oh my God. Well, I, I'm just gonna say that the, the most dangerous thing about APAC right now and their ilk are that are their ability to raise money and to, in, you know, uh, injected into our election system, whether it's for school board or city council or Congress, they have, you know, in the last cycle shown that they see the writing on the wall. They know that progressive values and Zionism are mutually exclusive. And so they are trying to fight any progressive, even if it's someone who hasn't even gotten to office yet, and they're not sure. If they're progressive, they do not want them in office. So I think, that, I think that that's their biggest power right now because people don't really trust them in, in as far as, they're, they're not, messaging isn't their big thing, but it is gonna be a big problem right now because we have a administration now that is so hostile to humanity and to human rights that um, it's going to be a big challenge next year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also like to add the importance of your role in establishing such a powerful m organization that can fight the effort of, MP of APAC. Uh, whenever we meet with a council, with a congressman or a senator, there's always a representative of APAC sitting with us, by the way, always. We are the Arab or a Muslim American community. Why is he sitting with us? Oh, he's my staff member. How can you afford hiring an attorney as a staff member on a $40,000 a year? Well, they stipend it. They give him the difference just so he can stay there. So I say for the past 20 years, I've seen so many fundraisings collecting money to buy rice and bread and medication to Gaza. If we just take 20% of that, if we took 20% of that and putting, putting it in a local organization who was promoting policies and, and, and things for the sake of the people of Gaza, we would not have seen what we saw this week this month. So we need to change and shift our mind how we give our donations to the people of Gaza by supporting organizations who would do similar work. Wonderful. We actually have time for just one last question, then it's time for Maghrib. Uh, Salam, uh, right in front. Oh, 
Oh, there you go. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, can you hear me? No. I can, but hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for bringing up FOSNA. I actually uh, was able to travel to Israel-Palestine with uh, the great name Atik. You must know him. It was uh, quite a privilege. Um, the question I had was, I'm not from California. I'm from the East Coast. And the Hispanic community is very pro-Israeli. And we're having trouble sort of breaking into that community and into... Uh, the information they're getting is coming from their ministers and their churches. And I'm wondering if you have any suggestions about, you know, how that community can be broken into? It, it's every community, whether it's Latino or otherwise, is going to have to embrace and, and be open to learning and, 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 and hearing out um, folks like uh, people from FOSNA and, and like myself, you know, it's the same concept. They just have to let us in the door. They have to listen to us. We have to uh, coordinate with pro-Palestinian Latinos. There's plenty of them. Um, and just get our foot in the door and educate and show, show the realities of what's happening. One, one word, intersectionality. Yep. Intersectionality, yep. the oppression of yep. all. Yep. Oppressed minorities is yeah. the same intersectionality. Yeah. Take every opportunity to reach out to people and yeah. educate them. Yeah. Just a, a personal experience. I have a contractor who comes to my house. He comes once every quarter. He walks in my house, and now he knows that I am from the place where Jesus, peace be upon him, is. And it gave me an opportunity to educate him. Now he goes back not just to his family, but he goes back to his church. Yeah, absolutely. And every time they say something, he says, nope, my friend tells me otherwise. Yeah. And I make myself available to come and teach and educate. You change one heart, you can change a million hearts. So just stay steadfast, but really talk to normal people. Don't miss that opportunity. We, we, ha we do have to wrap up. Brother, would you like to say anything you know, within the last 30 seconds? Well, we, we have a huge Palestinian community in, in California who only speak Spanish, right? They don't speak English. And uh, they're all in the markets and the downtown. And let's reach out to them and see how we can connect with that. And then the, the, what, what uh, Esti said, you know, the, the Hispanic community is struggling a lot with the immigration things. And their civil rights are taken away because of that. So what can we do to help them with that? How can we help them when it comes to that? So they can see that we care, actually. And I think, I think we're going to have to close it out with that. Uh, we do have prayer starting, uh, starting soon. I do want to just say one final thing. Um, I, I was an advisor in the US Senate for about six years. We do, at the time then, and we still do, they do, keep track of who calls, how many people are calling, how many letters are being sent in. It does matter. Uh, don't, make a pol don't make their elected officials, um, don't make it easy for them to vote the wrong way. Remind them that there is a cost of voting the wrong way. Disengaging will ensure that it is easy for them to do so. Do not, do not be uh, disillusioned by this. Keep voting, keep supporting candidates that you feel fit, Keep going to fundraisers, making, make sure that they know who you are, make sure they know what they have to lose if they continue to vote the way that they do. There is that segment of the U.S. Uh, House Representatives and the U.S. Senate that if, there is, if we can flip them, the political landscape, the U.S. foreign policy can look significantly different. Thank you.